Today's lecture has one number 132 in the ABCs of Communism series that accompanies um, volume 8, which uh, will be forthcoming on uh, communism in North America, primarily primary to white contact. And uh, this takes me back, just as an aside, to my very first uh, archaeological uh, project, or I was a student in a field school by the University of California, Los Angeles, was holding in North Central California near the town of Chico. We stayed at Chico State University uh, dormitories, and um, we had to get up at 4.30 in the morning because it was so hot that summer in July and August. It was eight weeks long. It cost uh, $400, and it was the our reactionary governor, Ronald Reagan, had just been going through the uh, university budget on a line-by-line -line basis and had decided that uh, if these uh, spoiled rich kids in California wanted to take these crazy courses like archaeology in the summertime, they could pay for it. Well, uh, and uh, so Rachel and I coughed up $400 for this course, which, you know, this is well before the Nixon devaluation of the dollar by 500%, so that would, that 400 right there would be 2,000 today, plus all of the inflation which has occurred. And it was quite a chunk for us, but I knew by this time that I was going to um, approach the problems that we are in this series, in these books, and, but it was way down the road. First I had to learn the techniques, the skills of archaeology, which is why this course was important. And then I had to uh, get to the University of Calgary and go to the far north where I thought I would hone my skills um, uh, on resolving some of the problems of uh, far northern archaeology, like the entry of the first people into the New World, which eventually we did. Uh, and then somewhere down the road, I would uh, be able to follow up with McNeish and uh, uh, solve the problems that Karl Marx had faced very, in the very beginning that he discussed in his ethnological notebooks. And um, I knew the answers would be found in the ground, so this was one step, and I was looking a long ways ahead, and now 50 odd years later, these eight volumes, when they're finished, are the culmination of my most important uh, life work. So, with those in initial comments, let me say our discussion today is the agricultural revolution in California, and uh, because we've already discussed the lithic in previous chapters and lectures. And in our study of sociocultural evolution in North America, we now come to the archaic agricultural revolution in the archaeological province of California. Now this entity begins with the part of Oregon just south of where the apocalyptic floods of glacial Lake Missoula entered the Pacific Ocean, and then runs southward through Baja, California, then westward from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. And as I say, we reviewed the lithic and the proto-archaic of the far west that included California in previous chapters and lectures, so the archaic hunting and gathering and formative agricultural revolution that occurred in the San Joaquin Valley, the Los Angeles Basin, and the south coast of California in the Mission Valley um, are going to be our topics, and I decided to use the Maidu population of north and uh, north central California as our representative culture to discuss these archaeological stages. The Maidu people lived in the mountain valleys in the drainage of the North Fork of the Feather River in the nor northern Sierra Nevada mountains. These include the American Valley near Quincy, the Indian Valley near Greenville, the Genesee Valley near Taylorsville, the Big Meadows, now covered by Lake Almanor. In addition, some lived in the mountain meadows near Westwood and Honey Lake Valley across the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada near Susanville. Now, the linguistic Maiduan population in late prehistoric times was about 9,000 people, with the Maidu numbering 3,000. And um, I just should comment that you could consider that these people were occupying the time of roughly 200, 300 uh, B.C. up until um, the time of 
white contact, which was under after 1500, of course, after A.D. 1500. Now, I encountered them archaeologically on my first field school in archaeology in 1967 at a Maidu village site about 30 miles from Chico, California. It was July and August and extremely hot that summer, so we had to eat breakfast and leave the dorms at Chico State, where we were living, at 4.30 a.m. It was also the first year that Ronald Reagan, as I said, was governor of California, and he'd gone through this University of California budget line by line, eliminating what he considered frills, for which students should pay full tuition, this including our field school located near Chico. Now, as I say, Rachel and I had to cough up $400 for this eight-week course, and nevertheless, it was important because I'd already decided to become an archaeologist and had picked the University of Calgary as my target for my Ph.D. Now, the previous year, over 100 students had showed up for this field school. But this year, in 1967, only four undergraduates, including me, and two graduate students appeared. There were eight professors. Now, the University of California bosses in L.A. decided to let this class go through since the professors had to be paid anyway, but it would be the last year. I got a lot of personal attention every hour of the eight hours we put in each day, so California's reactionary governor did me a favor by accident. Now, the first pit I dug under close supervision of uh, these professors exposed a Maidu woman's kitchen with all her stone tools laid out neatly. And as you can imagine, having never uh, dug up anything before, I was super excited and extraordinarily happy. Now let's take a look at the mode of production of the Maidu and first of all the technological half of that mode of production. The Maidu were migratory fishermen, hunters, and gatherers. Men did the hunting, the women did the vegetable food preparation. Acorns were a staple of the Maidu diet. Each adult may have consumed up to 2,000 pounds of acorns a year. At age 10, girls would begin to assist the women with the processing. Tools were essential for processing the acorns. Now, the mighty women collected the very best acorns by shaking oak tree branches. The acorns were stored up for a year. Now, once the acorns were, acorns were sufficiently dry, mighty women and girls used small hammer stones to crack them open. Now, the hammer stones made it easier to get to the nut meat. Stone anvils were essential to the work of the Maidu. They laid acorns on these flat, heavy stones and used hammer stones to crack open the nuts. Stone anvils are among the most frequently found relics of ancient California Indian culture. Now, Maidu women and girls used small, scoop-shaped winnowing baskets to hold acorns that had been shelled. They then used their hands to remove the skin coatings. With the baskets, they tossed the acorns into the air, which helped to release the skins. Now, mighty women and girls used milling stones, which were larger than hammer stones, to pound the acorns into meal. They also used a wooden or stone stick called a pezzle, and a rounded stone or wooden object called a mortar to make the acorn flour. Pounding acorns was hard work, and these tools made it a little easier. Women and girls would spend entire days singing, laughing, and telling stories as they worked. Now, after the women and girls pounded the acorns into meal, they sifted the meal into fine flour. Now, they used three different baskets to do this, and a soap root brush to do the sifting. With the soap root brush, which was made from the fibers of the soap root plant, they swept the fine flour away from the larger chunks of acorn that still required pounding. Now, my new men made obsidian, bone, and wood tools. The best bows for hunting were made of yew and were traded widely. They also made boats, tule reed rafts in the valleys, and blunt end dugouts in the high mountains. The mighty men cut fallen trees and hollowed out logs for canoes. They made knives from obsidian, basalt, and flint that was mined in caves, removing chunks to take back home and work into these knives and other tools. These, uh, were manuf these stone tools were manufactured by percussion and pressure flaking, and they included projectile points, scrapers, cores, choppers, hammer stones, knives, and drills. With regard to the projectile points, I want to point out a couple of things. There are 16 pages listing projectile point types for the Northern and Central California peoples, including the Maidu. 
and these can be broken, however, into four general groups of stemmed, notched, lanceolate, and bifurcated categories. When you get your book, you'll see pictures of these. Now, the arrowheads are the most common, leading me to think that large animals such as bears and mountain lions were more frequently trapped rather than hunted with uh, spears or bows and arrows. Now, the utility of a projectile point typology for us is that through seriation and hard dating, we can establish an excellent chronology for the Maidu sites. But one other important factor, and that is, these people had lots of spare time. The, uh, uh, and one of the things that people do with their spare time that diverts it from being involved in actual production, and, and remember this is a stage of primitive communism where the actual slogan is to produce as little as is absolutely necessary. And so beautifying projectile points is a tried and true all over the world uh, method that primitive people used, primitive communist people used, these are all homo sapiens, um, that uh, were one way of utilizing this, this free time. And uh, it has its own consequences, as I think you know by now, uh, not the least of which is that even though you may be doing all of this in order to avoid production, and in reality, making up these tools better and more effective will, uh, in the long run, <laughs> create uh, the kind of surplus that you really don't want to have on hand at the moment. At any rate, it's a dialectical contradiction. Now, taking a look at other tools, ground stone in particular, food processing tools found at MIDE sites feature a ground stone and hammer stone complex, such as the one that I dug up from the MIDE Indian woman's kitchen that I just mentioned. Now, bone artifacts, tools made from animal bones include bone awls and fragments for basket making and repairing and needles for clothing manufacturing. And there were shell beads found in all of these sites, including the ones in um, Chico. Clamshell disc beads have centrally drilled holes with diameters of 1.1 centimeter, 1.0 centimeter, and 0.9 centimeter. Now, presumably this is for use in different kinds of clothing, but we do know that the Maidu engaged in trade for them with peoples on the coast of California, and the Maidu used these disc beads for personal adornment and as money-like barter facilitators. Archaeologically, they date to the late Horizon II uh, phase, A.D. 1450 to 1800. Now, animals hunted and gathered include uh, the goose and the swan, the deer, the dog, the coyote, the elk, the freshwater snail, the jackrabbit, bobcat, mule deer, rodents, the pocket gopher, the wood rat, the squirrel, and the freshwater western pearl shell. Now, the social organization of these people was one in which the tribal Maidu lived in small villages. The tribal council leaders were selected from among available women and men, and the tribal council was responsible for settling internal disputes and negotiating differences between villages. The Maidu were organized as clan villages. Communities ranged in size from 100 to 500 persons and were led by a chief who lived in the largest central village. Villagers elected the chief with a part-time religious specialist, that is a shaman, advising after receiving a message from the spirits. And the chief acted with the advice of a council of elders, which we would call consiglieri. As such, the Maidu were ethnographically at the stage of simple chiefdoms. Now the villages, being clan-based, practiced a patrilineal descent reckoning and a matrilocal post-marital residence pattern so that new men entered each village on a regular basis. This strengthened the bonds between these villages. Each village was an exogamous patrilineal unit called an okapna. Sodality membership for men and women further bound individuals in each village to others in other villages. Each village was a distinct land-owning unit holding the land in common for all the villagers and was the de facto social organizational foundation for Maidu society. These enlarged kin sodality organized villages engaged in group production 
where the concrete laboring activities of the individual were de facto abstracted from time to time through joint communal effort, the netting of migrating fish and the planned burning of grasslands to encourage the growing of acorn nut trees are examples of pooling labor power. The modern homogenizer of labor power, the factory clock, did not govern these pooled labor power categories. Nevertheless, we can see that labor power has been placed in a clearly proto position for this kind of homogenized labor power. There is a certain amount of time regulation even if it is only we work from dawn to dusk. Now we can say in strictly economic terms that the next step for this primitive proto-homogenization of labor power is the actual commoditization of labor power. This proto-labor power could be allocated to community or inter-community tasks and or otherwise put up for exchange. A more precise term given our temporal perspective would be that this pooling of labor power is a form of proto-commoditized labor power. Now, ideology. The religious tradition was the Kuksu cult, that's K-U-K-S-U. This central California religious system was based on a male secret society. It was characterized by the Kuksu, or Big Head Dances. Maidu elder Marie Potts says that the Maidu are traditionally a monotheistic people. They greeted the sunrise with the prayer of thankfulness at noon, they stopped for meditation, and at sun, they communed with Kadiapan and gave thanks for blessings throughout the day. A traditional spring celebration for the Maidu was the bear dance, when the Maidu honored the bear coming out of hibernation. The bear's hibernation and survival through the winter symbolized perseverance to the Maidu, who identified with the animal spiritually. The, Huk the Kuksu cult system was also followed by the Pomo and the Patwan among the Wintun. Missionaries later forced the peoples to adopt Christianity, but they often retained elements of their traditional practices. Among the most important of the mighty gods was their creator, usually called World Maker, who made a first man called Kuksu and a first woman called Morning Star Woman. Next World Maker created a new race of people and told Kuksu and Morning Star Woman to teach them everything they needed to know about survival, law and order, dancing, and ceremonies. The new race of people were the Maidu, and they were sent out into the world speaking various languages to form many tribes. And the Maidu believed they were the center of all creation. World Maker intended for people to live easy, eternal lives, so death did not exist at first. Coyote, a fun-loving character who sometimes helped people but also made mischief, introduced it. One example of the trouble he caused the Maidu was changing the California landscape so it became more rugged, thus making life harder for the tribes. Most Maidu believed in an individual soul, which they called the heart. When a person died, his or her heart was said to have left. The soul of a good person traveled along the Milky Way until it reached World Maker. The souls of bad people were reborn to live forever as rocks or bushes. The Maidu also believed that every object had a soul, which was set free when the object was destroyed. Maidu priests had mystical powers and could communicate with spirits. Some had both healing power and spirit power, while others had one power or the other, but not both. At their frequent religious ceremonies, the Maidu made offerings to World Maker and to earth spirits. Sometimes they acted out stories about their gods. In return for their offerings, <clears throat> the people expected a good relationship with nature. This good relationship brought an abundance of game animals and wild foods and sufficient rain. Now I want to make some comments on the dialectic of cause and process among the Maidu Mod Spectrum Wild Resource Exploitation and how it triggered a new general crisis. The Maidu faced a crisis in their mode of production when it reached the capability to exploit virtually every living animal and plant resource at hand. Why did this mode of production give rise to a crisis? Because such exploitative ability has within it the certainty that surplus social product is increasingly likely as an outcome. This is exactly the opposite of what previous social time expenditure 
was about. By dumping social time, the Maidu had managed to stave off the terminal deepening of the crisis of increased competence in production, that is, too much on hand. But now the potential of great surplus social product on hand was clear and present. In other words, the broad spectrum wild resource revolution that had been inherent abstractly was now at the door. It was the enemy at the gate, and the ways of a million years or more would no longer suffice to ameliorate the outcome. Every step they would now take to delay the inevitability of surplus social product on hand, instead made having it on hand the immediate and irreversible result. The Maidu had learned a very great deal about their environments and had started controlling them in a variety of ways. Not the least of the results of that control was the ability to spend long periods in one place and to produce quite sufficient social product with a relatively minimum of labor input. Social affluence was now achieved with an absolute minimum of labor input. The classical work on this original affluent society is published as the first paper in the book Stone Age Economics by Marshall Solins. The original edition was published in 1974 by Tavistock in London and is available in all libraries of tertiary institutions. A new 2004 edition is available for Routledge in London, uh, 348 pages. Those of you interested in anthropological economics in the cross-cultural comparative sense are urged to study uh, that text. Now, the Maidu could work fewer hours and do other more creative things. However, although the reduced labor time input into production could keep the output to just value, creative activity also led to more knowledge about the world. And this is what I meant. This, what I said, this implied the ability to produce even more social product. By 20,000 years ago in California, people were making the final steps toward irreversible release of surplus social product. Another way of putting it is that they were making their first tentative steps into the agricultural revolution. Over the next 10,000 years from the Maidu people would become irreversibly committed to this new archaic mixed economy way of life producing food rather than collecting it, and in this process they would come face to face, finally, with the enemy within. At the core of this transition is the reality that social time consumed in experimentation, perfection, and beautification of tools, such as the myriad of 16 pages of projectile point types, rather than engaging social time in direct production, such as hunting and gathering, had backlashed dialectically had it made people into e being even more capable of creating surplus social uh, creating social surpluses than they were before the band general crisis continues produce enough but no more in a more sophisticated form of extraordinarily complex social time usage however this increased concentration on thinking abstractly in order to engage in such extraordinary social time dumping is simply exacerbating the rate of development. That is, the developing rate of this tendency to potentially being able to significantly increase production by making it certain people know more and more about plants and animals and every other aspect of their objective daily lives. In other words, the more they know about nature, because of this extraordinary amount of thought and time devoted to de facto learning, the more they could, if they wished, increase their production of the material fundamentals of life. The proof lies in the rapid emergence of broad-spectrum exploitation in the latter part of the lithic and in turn its transformation through the proto-archaic into the agricultural revolution. This is a distinct socio-cultural evolutionary state change flowing from the acute nature of the general crisis. The new formula that we've been following looks like this and when you get your, pro uh, your book you'll be able to see it graphically, uh, L plus T uh, gives us V1 plus V2 plus surplus social product. Non-productive time creates more productive potential. Now, then I give again the list of the definition of all of these terms. We don't need to do it again, but it's here so you don't have to flip back through other lectures. Now, preventing social time from becoming labor time was the multi-million year tested, tried and true 
method of avoiding surplus social product. Surplus social product is more than just surplus. It is, in modern economic terms, proto-surplus value. Surplus social product will become surplus value, and like all value, both one and two, comes ultimately from human labor. Eventually, human individual and group labor will become the economic category we call human labor power. As we have seen, while the Maidu were still in the hunting and gathering mode of production, they had found that more mouths to feed made having social surplus on hand less probable, at least at first. That is to say that tribes are simply larger bands tied together by more complex kinship reckoning systems and cross kin line cutting sodalities. Would, with their larger population numbers, naturally require larger amounts of value one and even value two. Thus, momentary increases in production were absorbed quickly by more mouths. A corollary proof we can see in the ethnographic record when populations are small much of the year. Then people arrange themselves in territorial bands until seasonal bounty provides the objective basis for a get-together of all the bands in a tribal setting. Then the greater number of mouths quickly absorbed the extra social product. Always underlying this way of life is the commandment, commandment not to produce more surplus social product than absolutely necessary. And when it is necessary <clears throat> to make the larger settlement pattern the option of choice to make certain the targeted consumption of said seasonal bounty. The Great Divide The Great Divide in the mode of production base of society lies at the boundary between individual concrete labor time and the value it produces and collectively abstracted socially necessary labor time and the surplus social product which will later be surplus value that it produces. That great divide occurs in the socio-cultural evolutionary stages of chiefdoms. However, its origins lie as far back as the beginning of proto-commoditized labor time among tribal hunters and gatherers, and this includes among the Maidu in California. After the chiefdom stages are the three stages of slavery, feudalism, and capitalism of the servitude epic, properly understood, abstract and socially necessary labor time, is the basis of what is now the academic field of political economy. Socially necessary labor time is the technical definition of value, <clears throat> that is, abstracted socially necessary labor time. The agricultural revolution. Tribes at bottom are just bigger groups of people. Yes, they have a more complex kinship system of organization by far than do the bands. Kinship is the only means they have, after all, to organize society, and the larger the group, the greater demands on the kinship way of doing things um, from day to day and generation to generation, and tribes have sodality organization, also which simply means that there are institutions that cut across kin lines, such as men's clubs and women's clubs, devoted to different tasks. Nevertheless, fundamentally, tribes are still just elaborated bands. Now, in the old world, tribal social organization is the basis upon which the agricultural revolution evolved and as such is the key diagnostic. In the Americas, the agricultural revolution took longer to evolve because the predicate animal and plant stock was a qualitatively different in that it was so much smaller. In the Americas, only camelids, turkeys, and small mammals existed to domesticate and among domesticatable grass seeds, only corn, that is, zea maize, had sufficient protein for supporting populations larger than bands. So tribal social organization is just a part of the diagnostic social structures of a new world social organization sharing that label with bands. And we've seen in the eastern woodlands that there were other domesticates which provided a, a, a protein component flour, but um, that's a different story and we've already covered it. With or without tribal organization, people in the New World also got to semi-sedentary village life because of the efficiency of the broad-spectrum wild resource exploitation revolution now so well developed. In California, it was often the mode of production at the band level of population size 
and when we uncover semi-sedentary hunting-gathering band campsites in California, we know that these people would eventually have developed tribal stage social organization with its agriculture and animal husbandry. They simply are taking longer to domesticate the limited wild precursor plant and animal stocks during their advanced broad spectrum wild resource exploita exploitation day to day and of course the uh, their horticultural use of the acorn trees was a, something which allowed them to move more quickly in this direction. At any rate, whether as bands or tribes, the essential diagnostic we want to understand is the revolution that agriculture as technology brought to California. Surplus was now irreversible. Archaeologically, we often speak of a set of artifactual diagnostics that accompanied the formative California agricultural revolution, ground and polished stone tools, milling and grinding tools to turn high-protein seeds into flour, village life, and pottery, and of course the acorn nuts into flour. However, what is critically different is that people are producing food rather than collecting it. With their agricultural suite of food production arts, it is now inherently certain that people will produce a surplus. The general crisis driving this stage is the need for ongoing, continuing, on-hand surplus being considered a necessity by the Maidu. This stands in contradistinction to the danger of a system that could, unregulated, become an open-door invitation to violence. Inequality in possession of articles of agricultural production is that kind of invitation, especially if it is appears permanent or appears to be so. Now, our production formula now looks like this. L plus LP, that is concrete labor plus labor power, uh, applied to technology, and the arrow causes, uh, gives us value one, value two, plus surplus. Uh, surplus in the family farms, surplus needed uh, versus dangerous surplus. And then again, I give the definitions for all of these terms so that you don't have to flip back to earlier chapters. Um, one reason for the irreversible release of surplus was and is that the Maidu needed surplus for the rainy day. A myriad of events could bring catastrophic uh, catastrophe to crops and acorn trees, floods, droughts, insect pestilence, fire, disease, hurricanes, and tornadoes. In these predicaments, the Maidu families have to have rever reserves to see them through. So surplus social product has been irreversibly released with the coming of the agriculture of the California archaic mixed economy. Nevertheless, this kind of surplus has a tendency to be irregular due to outside forces, just as the, such as those just listed. Now, commoditized labor time has also become a new, if irregular, feature of the California archaic mode of production. Why is this so? Because the Maidu had to pool their collective labor power, at least occasionally, for burning acorn nut fields. Within this California archaic setting, the larger families will produce more than the smaller families, if for no other reason than that the larger families have more hands. Population will expand simultaneously because more hands make self-sufficiency of the domestic village unit far more certain and simultaneously because the more mouths there are to feed, the less surplus will be accumulating in individual villages at any given moment. More hands and more mouths constitute a vicious circle running inside and in the same direction as another circle of need for surplus for hard times. And in both cases, these two circles are encouraging increased production, meaning more labor hours and or labor time hours devoted to productive activity. These two circles of causation encompass another counter-rotating inner circle consisting of societal mechanisms for controlling the magnitude of surplus. Joining these three counter-rotating circles are people themselves. People in this model are the ball bearings, which make these social movements work smoothly. This is the important nexus. We can say it again, in primitive Maidu villages, it was the, quote, more hands and mouths and inevitable hard times that means we need the surplus idea, unquote. This functioned as the central ideological feature driving production. That is, driving production beyond the old hunting-gathering band level of 
of minimal subsistence requirements. On the other hand, as we have seen, it was the existence of surplus and the real or potential inequality between the village families that it created merely by existing that was now the at-bottom source of jealousy, envy, and coveting. These three features being the ultimate danger confronting primitive communism. Acceptance of the new reality of constant surplus on hand uh, sets this new farming village way of life fundamentally apart from a subsistence pattern hitherto lasting millions of years. In other words, this drive for surplus, regardless of magnitude, runs diametrically counter to the millions of years old tradition of handling potential and real surplus with A, minimal labor input, and B, sharing. The general crisis of tribal agriculture put the Maidu into the stage of simple chiefdoms. The engine at the core of the California tribal village archaic as a distinct socio-cultural evolutionary stage was the principal mode of production was Maidu society's fundamental needs. These needs being permanent surplus for as free distribution needed in case of environmental stresses and two for regular redistribution of support uh, to support community efforts and perhaps one or two professional specialists. Surplus potential increases with the steady growth of the new economy and the population that provides the domestic village unit with more hands and is sustainable in the new economy. A growing population level in and of itself reduces the amount of surplus on hand at any given moment and simultaneously makes it necessary uh, that new levels of production be regularly achieved to support the rising population numbers. These central features constitute the driving force to increase production and become antagonistic to the counter-running tradition of discouraging surplus social product from existing. In satisfying the need for more production by assigning more persons to agriculture and sedentary life, leading to bigger families living in each individual farm, society had created a self-triggered mechanism. This led to an inevitable increase for surplus social product being created in the villages and thus in society as a whole. On the other hand, this irre irreversible release of surplus social product was certain to generate the societal dissolution effects of jealousy, envy, and coveting unless it was immediately and promptly ameliorated, ameliorated, shared in some effective way. Initially, the effective way of countering centrifugal social dis dissolution will be the tribal council collection of surpluses and then the storage of said surpluses until the time comes for redistribution or some kind of socially approved consumption. Eventually, it required the simple chieftain. So, the new general crisis within the old general contradiction. The general contradiction, on the other hand, continues as it has for the previous many millions of years. The drive not to produce surplus social product, but only produce needed in the face of the ever-present reality that people in such societies can produce much more than they do. Both the general crisis and the general contradiction found mutually satisfactory resolution when the Maidu Tribal Council collected surpluses above and beyond what was agreed upon to be necessary for the annual upkeep of one given person. In other words, if X is the amount needed for one Maidu person as agreed upon, and Y is the number of persons in the Maidu uh, village unit, then Y times X is what each village family keeps. Everything above that number was then sent to the central storage accountants of the tribe or simple chiefdom. In this way, the larger families were assured of having what they needed, as were the smaller families. The inequality that otherwise would exist between different sized domestic units was leveled by the collection of everything above the agreed about amount. Then this surplus was transported, then this surplus was transported and stored at some central point, which was the tribe's warehouse. Uh, eventually, this was the simple chieftain warehouse. The first accountants would have been avocational tribal members. 
because it was in the tribal social structure that the village family surplus was first created, and some persons had to keep track of all of these contributions from the village families. Some family must be credited, perhaps some clan, sodality, moiety, and freitry must have been credited also. When these avocational accountants become central consigliore of the chiefdom, we have professional specialists. Should they then get involved in astronomy and religion, along with avocational shamans, we have the embryonic form of what will become another professional specialization, the priests and priestesses. Before the Maidu could autochthonously evolve into the ATC stage and the subsequent servitude epic, their socio-cultural evolution was cut short by white contact. And that brings us to a conclusion of this particular lecture. I want to move on the next one to the Texas area uh, because this was a, a, an important nexus between uh, Mexico and the domesticates of especially corn, but uh, also certain kinds of squash and beans that would make their way into the eastern woodlands and supplement what was already going on there, which we have already discussed. And uh, so we'll talk about uh, the uh, prehistoric Texas in the next lecture. And the one after that will be on prehistoric Florida. And uh, that's going to take care of it for this morning.